going and uh, giving up some of your time to listen to myself and Bert speak today. I'm going to take you through the journey that we have gone uh, through at Revolt uh, to working towards the SDGs and using it as our baseline for uh, the company and the, the way that we help and engage with our clients. And then also share some of the things that we've learned along the way in doing that. So firstly, a little bit about us. Um, we are, as Rebecca said, a design brand and marketing agency, and we work with clients uh, across many different fields from uh, industry or to consumer brands, and also from the startup level right through to global leading brands. And we work kind of right across the brand chain. So we work from the uh, innovation stage, so helping to find value propositions and looking at user research for how products and services could and should be entering the market or growing within their markets, all the way through to the, the brand and digital strategies and developing the marketing campaigns, and then also even in the paid media space and analytics of uh, figuring out how those campaigns are then working and gaining traction, and all the while looking to learn and improve from the data that we can glean from uh, those analytics. Then taking that back into the design space and, and further iterating on the business from there. Uh, I thought before I go into the details of us uh, and how we got to this journey, I just wanted to say that there are a million ways to contribute to the SDGs and this is just ours. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we came into using this as our measuring stick and, uh, and how we have done that in a way that is appropriate for us and our skill set. We are, as I say, a design and marketing brand or a design and marketing agency working with brands. And of course, that then means that it's more relevant for us to be working in middle and high income countries. Uh, so uh, that, that is kind of where we have focused our efforts not to not to try to do things that are not within our specific skill sets. So if we look back at the journey, Revolt started in 2008. And then in 2018, uh, came under new ownership for myself and my business partner, Gus Murray, who is today over in our Copenhagen office. He's the managing director and I'm the design director, as we talked about at the start. Uh, we come from large international network agencies. Uh, they are very financially driven culture, and that's kind of where we had uh, worked or sort of grown up in this industry and have very sort of factory-like work environments. Uh, where the staff are not necessarily treated in the best ways uh, and, and also you're kind of at the mercy of that financially driven culture all the time so that ends up where you work on any work that comes through the door and many of them are what we would say bad brands. So when we took over we had this vision of trying to create an agency for good. Uh, these are some of the things or the, the subjects that we were throwing around together. How can we work on only sustainable brands and not work on any bad brands and really focus on people and make a work environment that's better for uh, the sort of brains and skills that sit in our industry. Uh, so we, we had to sort of look at like what are we really able to do in order to create an agency that does that and actually is able to sustain itself because if we become too maybe worthy in our approach then it's going to be hard to get clients and of course we still have salaries to pay. How, how do we go about this? So if we look at where we sort of come from uh, and we take our quote unquote skills or abilities uh, and look at what we've been doing with those in our past lives and in previous jobs. Uh, we are then applying our skills and knowledge to brands, always with the goal of scaling those brands and doing that in many, many different ways. So focusing on their sales, their campaigns, their digital strategies, their customer experiences and so on and so on. So this became our kind of toolkit. OK, this is where we've come from. But what can we really influence? If we look at sustainability as a, uh, a high level topic, the real sort of progress that's going to happen with that is going to come from, at least in our, in our minds, going to come from governments and industries and the policy changes that happen within those. So what can we really influence with the toolkit that we had? So that led to us taking a slightly different skew and focusing more on consumers, consumer behavior, consumerism at scale, and what we can do using our backgrounds with helping grow brands and pushing brands uh, and always again being focusing on growing and growing the sales of those brands. How can we do that with more of a consumer led skew to it? So this became the kind of focus point of our uh, business. And then taking that one step further then of saying, okay, if we're, if we're going to focus on consumerism, what we really should be doing is focusing all of our skills and energy and that toolkit that I referenced and trying to 
push the growth of sustainable products and services. Every time we do that, then uh, that should be sort of what we say, a job well done. So if we can shift enough consumers uh, to use sustainable products and services, then we're able to use consumers for impact that goes beyond the, uh, the size and scale of the businesses themselves. It's not just about changing the materials that individual business uses or changing the way they are treating people or uh, looking at quality issues, whatever those things may be. If we're using the consumers to drive impact, we're able to drive impact at a scale that's bigger than ourselves, but also bigger than that business as well, or that client. Uh, and of course, that's all well and good, but we also have to look at the fundamental business goal. Uh, obviously, we're not just able to go and speak to a CEO and say, hey, let's just you know, focus on turning your business into the most sustainable it can be at all costs and uh, using your consumers for a vehicle for impact. We also need to help them succeed within their own business goals and stay alive and pay their salaries and uh, you know work to their shareholders and so on. So we developed uh, an internal sort of philosophy and working strategy, which we call the win-win-win, which is focusing on developing sustainable products and services that are equal parts good for the business, good for the planet and good for people. So by finding that sweet spot in the center, that's where we believe all businesses should be heading. And if they're not living up to that, then uh, that that's shouldn't be a product or service that we want to invest our toolkit in trying to help uh, move forward. So whilst that became the sort of internal philosophy, we looked then to the SDGs to become our universal measurement. Of course, if we, if we just look at ourselves as a business and how to market ourselves and to put ourselves in the market and drive new business and uh, new clients, trying to communicate this win-win-win philosophy every time we knock on someone's door is a hard entry point. We're having to educate them on what we mean. Uh, whereas if we move towards the SDGs as our measurement, it's already common language. It's something that CEOs and CMOs and CFOs are all focused on moving the businesses towards in some way, or at least they're aware of it if they're not already having that as a sharp focus. So by having that as a universal measurement, it meant that we were already speaking a common language uh, and, and able to sit at the table and have a discussion around something that we all understand from day one. That has also been something then that has become our own internal measuring stick. So at the end of the year now, rather than measuring ourselves on uh, profit or growth of uh, you know, manpower or, or any of the sort of normal traditional agency measuring sticks, we have um, a mix of percentage of the hours that we spend and the revenue that comes through the door and we work out that as a percentage uh, each year that contributes to the UN goals or aligns to the UN uh, SDGs. So each year since 2018, when we started measuring it, obviously with the previous owners, we don't have a measurement for 17. Uh, we've started to try and grow that year on year and focus on only using our skills on these SDG aligned projects. Uh, some of those just as examples are uh, our recent work with IKEA, for example, we're working with them to develop clean energy services uh, so with a brief of how do you get 110 million family members to move to clean energy, uh, working with Velix to try to educate professional home builders. So we're talking about companies that build hundreds of thousands of buildings per year. How do we help them understand the health impacts of having a controllable indoor climate? And then more recently, working with World Pride and Eurogames to help them develop their global communications for uh, making people feel more included to get involved in the pride movement. Uh, and then if we just move to things that we've learned from doing this, so that's kind of our journey uh, of, of how, how we've moved from the sort of traditional agency space and, and tried to shift that more to an SDG focused way of working. Um, one of the things that we've learned in doing that and trying to help brands either move towards more sustainable ways of working or, uh, or jump in on something that they're already doing in a sustainable way and try to accelerate the growth of that, is that selling sustainability at scale, and scale is the key part here, isn't always about sustainability. And just to be clear, sometimes it absolutely is. Sometimes that is a really important part of, uh, of why the, of the messaging of the product and why consumers would want to engage with it in the first place. If you look at sort of baby products, for example, something that I'm learning a lot about at the moment, uh, the, the, the materials and products that you wanna put against your baby's skin, of course, it's a selling point then that that is all natural and comes from a sustainable background. And then also things where you're shifting and pushing 
uh, industries that are already known by consumers to be a negative, um, such as uh, plastic bottles and things like that, that are sort of top of mind, top of mind to a general consumer base. But I want to talk about scale and if we're going to have uh, a real impact within the sustainability space, how can we move sustainability at scale? So I come back to our win-win-win philosophy, and we truly believe that if all products and services live up to this win-win-win, that that is where they are truly able to scale. And the reasons that this can sometimes fall down is when brands go all in on sustainability being their only USP and, uh, or unique selling point, and that tends to leave them thinking much more about the business and the planet end, and they forget about the people. And of course, if you forget about the people, then you're forgetting about what the consumer really needs and then potentially alienating, alienating them from the product or service that you're developing. So if we're going to avoid that, we need to understand two things about the consumer. One is where they sit on the consciousness scale and one is about the consumer burden. So the consciousness scale first, it's, it's the scale of consciousness of where the consumer sits within uh, the knowledge of sustainability issues and how prevalent that is in their purchase decision journey. So if we look at that on an actual scale, on one end, you have people who are just uninterested or uneducated on the importance of sustainability being a part of their decision-making journey when selecting a product or service. And then on one side, you have people who are inherently extremely passionate. Uh, and whilst 65% of people say they want to buy purpose-driven brands that advocate sustainability, the truth is actually that only 26% of people actually do that. And then if you look at the fact that 88% of consumers want brands to help them move to make a difference, then that leaves us kind of with this segment in the middle of people who are interested, uh, understand the benefits of it, and yet still don't move to make the purchase or still don't still are not willing to either spend more for the sustainable option or uh, take the next step in understanding how that can be an improvement for them. So this is a segment that we call the alienated and overwhelmed. And we believe that this comes from uh, what we call the consumer burden. And we'll unpack that a little bit for you now. So the burden that would make someone feel alienated and overwhelmed, of course, alienated can become from the fact that the price is just too high, it's out of my price point, so it alienates me from being able to uh, being, being able to take on that product or service versus a competitor. Of course, that's something that not everyone can control. Uh, but it's no surprise that people are saying more and more that they're feeling overwhelmed by the burden of engaging in this space and understanding why it should be a part of their uh, consumer journey. If you think uh, about someone who has uh, grown up, gone to school, and learned or, or taught them or been educated to go and work in a bank, for example. All of a sudden now we're asking them to be educated on, you know, how is this farmed? How much meat is too much meat? Why does it matter where my electricity comes from? It used to just be about not leaving the lights on. And yes, my car is diesel and I can't afford to change it. What do you mean my refrigerator efficiency rating? Cotton, what? Even milk is a problem now too. So we've got all of these like very in-depth specific areas of consumerism that all of a sudden we're asking people to be informed about in their decision journey. And that's just not necessarily realistic. And whilst we've come a long way with examples like the ones that are in front of you now, people understand, I think on a, on a large societal scale, what sustainable is, what organic is, what environmentally friendly means and green. But now the, the more cutting edge sustainable brands are pushing uh, a new vocabulary at them. And all of a sudden, we're expecting people to understand net positive, carbon negative, climate positive, green, clean, carbon neutral, zero positive, net zero, circular, carbon positive, zero waste. And I'll bet that even the more sustainably minded people in this audience listening now probably didn't even pick up the fact that two of those are inherently negative things and not parts of what should be a positive sales pitch. So the vocabulary is just ginormous. And I think we're asking and expecting too much from the average consumer. Which brings us back to how we win. And if we're really going to be able to drive sustainability at scale, then sustainability needs to be, from our perspective, hygiene. It needs to be a part of the sales pitch, but the sales pitch still needs to be focused on what we call, or how we say, the good old USP or the unique selling point. 
And just some examples of that, probably the biggest one uh, that uh, everyone can sort of point to and will understand is Tesla. I hate to give these sort of big examples, but Tesla pitched themselves as a company first and foremost on style and prestige and with cutting edge technology. And then, of course, it also doesn't run on fossil fuels and they have pushed the entire automotive industry to move towards electric. They've accelerated that entire process, but they did that by focusing on the USP of we're competing with those cooler BMW cars and so on with style and prestige and we're setting ourselves in that segment. Our work with IKEA, for example, around uh, selling solar panels or solar systems. The, the actual USP that we're going forward to the customer with is that you can save money from month one if you take the finance option. The finance money or the finance fee per month actually costs less than what you'll save in uh, electricity savings. So from month one, you'll save money. And that is the key thing that's going to get people to move towards going solar. And we've also made the complex research process very easy for them by configuring it all in the background. So all they need to do is enter their family size and all of a sudden they just get told what size solar system they need. Oh, and by the way, solar lowers your household footprint by 30%. And again, then some of our work with Velux around automated indoor climate control. By having automated climate control, you can save money on your bills. Uh, it also lowers your footprint and it will have improved health benefits. Uh, by having more airflow in your homes, it's been proven to uh, lower the effects of asthma and so on. So in summary, in just a short time, uh, we need to look at the consciousness scale and find where the, what the mindset is of your potential consumers and where does your product or, ser or service sit in that scale. If it is something that can sit in the general masses uh, and not sit specifically towards the passionates, then we need to look to the consumer burden. What burden would cause consumers or customers to feel alienated or, or overwhelmed? And if sustainability is not going to be the key, then we need to figure out if it is the if, if sustainability is the primary USP or if it should be uh, something else that is going to move them and sustainability is the add-on benefit that we need to kind of uh, sell in under the radar. That's for me. Thank you very much, Ryan, for that presentation. Lots to uh, think about. We've already got some questions coming in. I encourage everyone else who has been listening to uh, ask Ryan your most pressing questions. But Jonas asks, is there a conflict between scale and sustainability, large scale production of mass consumption versus sustainability? How are brands you're working with dealing with that? And is branding part of the solution? So for how are brands that we are working with scaling sustainability? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, how are they kind of balancing that, that need between kind of being sustainable, but also potentially producing things at scale? You're talking a little bit about uh, IKEA, for example. I think it really depends on uh, where you are in the stakeholder scale. So if we're working more on the innovation end, uh, that means that we're talking to that passionate segment if we look at that consciousness and scale. So um, internally within those organizations then the people that are sitting in those innovation roles around sustainability are inherently the passionate. Uh, then when you go back towards more the production and project management ends, obviously that dilutes the more that you move away from that passionate area. Um, companies like IKEA, they have it kind of front and center and it is their, their driving force. They are in what they call at the moment, the leap year of sustainability. And it's where they're trying to fast track things to move forward and I think that they are doing a very good job of looking at that holistically across everything they do. They're looking at new practices of how they produce their furnitures. Uh, we actually have a team with them working at the moment about around their circularity and, uh, and how, to, how to move them towards more sustainable practices and the services then that can go forward towards consumers to help them validate that from a business perspective uh, and hopefully then fast track them being able to try out some of these new practices at a larger scale. And Alison asks a very important question. How do you deal with greenwashing and how do you detect it? Uh, I, th I think it's, it's always extremely difficult, right? I mean, the, the companies that we're fortunate enough to work with, people like Velux, they've made massive, um, massive commitments to move towards carbon neutrality by 2030. And they're extremely dedicated towards doing it. And I think you can... If you're working in this space, you can kind of feel when people are 
uh, authentic and genuinely passionate about uh, the work that they're doing versus people who are trying to chase the label. And as soon as we talk to the client and they are very focused on getting some kind of certification, uh, that's usually kind of a sign that they just want an outward facing badge uh, to, yeah, to take on the greenwashing perspective. Uh, and as uh, is following on from Jonas's question, do you have any examples where you have helped companies to reduce consumption of physical products to lower their carbon footprint? And he says, from my point of view, it is much better to take away the bus as compared to buying a new Tesla. Actually, unfortunately, the, the project that would have the best example of this is one that I can't actually really talk about. But later this year, there'll be a launch in several markets of a new project with a, a large company, uh, which is extremely focused on um, reducing rather than uh, scaling something which is inherently better than its competitors. It is actually focused on reducing and the business model has been shaped in a way that's different from the rest of the industry where yes, they will make less money by doing it this way, um, but the reduction benefits will be astronomically higher than what they would be if they did it the sort of more traditional way with a slightly better product. So there is kind of a shift towards that type of thinking. Yeah, because if you if you can work within reduction, of course, a lot of the times that means less costs on production. So whilst there might not necessarily be the same margin in what you're doing, if you happen to produce less, that margin could be made up by having less of a manufacturing cost, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you used to ask the questions, what is, what is a bad brand? <laughs> I think the bad brands are the ones that are, uh, have a lot of lobbyists and are uh, trying not to try trying to keep industries the way they are for the sake of their own financial gains or position in their, their individual markets. Ones um, that we don't want to help. A pressing question that many are asking us at the moment is around how do you actually measure the impact of your solution? Everett asks, are you assessing a solution's SDG impact, both positive and negative, and how it can be improved? Again, it's extremely hard. We've been talking about it even in this uh, SDG community here uh, about the issues around measurement and the accuracies of that. For us, in our, as I sort of talked about at the start, we are not in a position where we can help poverty in Africa with our skill sets. So we have to focus on what we can do uh, and change in consumer behavior in the markets that we are able to affect. Uh, I think that comes the same within measurement uh, or within the attribution of what we're doing towards the SDGs. We know what the SDGs are focused on. We know what they're moving towards as the kind of vision and end goal for each one of the goals. And we're just trying to do our bit within pointing everything that we're doing to be aligned to that. Uh, and if we can do that with the skills that we do have, then we, we have to just be happy about that. And I think from the scale perspective, every customer we can get to buy one of the quote unquote good brands or good products versus the bad. Uh, for us, that's our way of judging a job well done. Excellent, excellent questions and uh, answers. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you so much, Ryan, for that insightful presentation.